been doing really well on my reading so far this month. Um, I've not only just been reading the books from my TBR, but I have also been reading a few books here and there that also fit the theme and that um, I guess have allowed me to explore the theme in different ways than I had originally planned, um, but ones that weren't necessarily strictly ones I had kind of chosen, which I knew would happen um, and it's kind of like why I didn't choose like a very big TBR or anything. But anyway, I have read the next two books from TBR um, and they're the ones I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the first one I read was The Wonderling by Mira Bartok and the second one I read was um, A Place Called Perfect by Helena Duggan. And these two books were actually both five star reads. So I'm going to just kind of give you a brief overview of the sort of reviews I guess for both of them and then talk a little bit more about why I think they were five star reads and kind of going from there. So the first one, um, The Wonderling by Mira Bartok. Now this was such a beautiful read and it's quite a chunky one too. Um, so it's definitely aimed for kind of like the older children um, because honestly if you try to sell a book like of this size to a grandparent or a parent who's looking for a book for an eight year old or a nine year old they're instantly going to be put off um, but it's one that I think you could really sell really well to the parents of kind of like the 11 12 year old um, reader because it it engrosses them in a story that is really exciting and it is very reminiscent of a lot of sort of fables and fairy tales. The story of this one follows a groundling and the groundlings are this sort of co collection of people who are not quite human but not quite animals. There's in the world that is created here there is a hierarchy um, of sort of races I guess um, and the groundlings are kind of in the middle ground but very much um, oppressed more so than animals because the groundlings have the capacity of human thought and speech and stuff um, so therefore they have been denigrated to the point of being an animal but they aren't so in many cases it demonstrates itself in a much worse sort of oppression um, and the main character Arthur who is part fox with only one ear um, and he's like the size of a boy and he has, he kind of walks around on his legs and talks and everything. He has been sent to an orphanage for groundlings and in this orphanage things are terrible. Um, so him and a new groundling friend that he makes called Trinket plan their escape and then they get out into the, into the world at large, um, to the city to try to find out who um, Arthur really is because he doesn't know anything about his parents, where he came from doesn't know anything about why he is the way that he is um, and they try to find that out and lots of kind of misdemeanors and misadventures happen um, which is really enjoyable. Not much is given away in the synopsis and I guess not much is given away in the plot that I kind of just delivered to you because that is ultimately the plot of any kind of book of this sort of ilk. Um, however when I was reading this I literally had no clue where this story was going and I think that was really great and what I loved so much about it was that it wasn't predictable in any way at all and the kind of overall arc of it and the sort of twists that were coming about because of the way the plot was developing just didn't feel predictable in the slightest and I honestly was reading it wondering what is actually this book trying to tell me what is this book trying to say and as the um, plot like grew and grew and grew and it became so much bigger than the storyline you thought you were actually going into, you really became immersed in a world that kind of felt really true to life, yet so kind of different and fantastical. Um, the world in this is kind of steampunky, it's like this Victorian-esque setting um, with all these ridiculous clothes and like flying bicycles and metal contraptions that um, are designed to do specific things. Um, so that in itself is very interesting. It's a really well-developed world even though you only see such a small pocket of it and you don't even learn that much about it um, because you're only learning what's important to the plot. And I think that was something that I really enjoyed is that the pacing of the information that you were given really helped you to actually stick to the plot and I think in a storyline that is so broad in scope as this one is um, 
it was a wise decision on the author's behalf to make it that the, the, um, the information or the world at large didn't get out of control and you weren't lost amongst that, whilst also perhaps possibly getting lost with the plot. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think it was a really heartfelt book with some really beautiful messages in it. Throughout reading this, it felt like um, it felt like you were watching a stop motion animated film. You know, like like the kind of uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox by Wes Anderson. This kind of felt like that style of book, and I was very excited to know this is being adapted into a film. Um, so hopefully we can see this in the way that I imagined it because I think it was so evocative with the imagination um, and was just really wonderful to read. And then funnily enough, on the flip side to The Wonderling, we have a place called Perfect by Helena Duggan, which I think from the second chapter, you know exactly the plot, you know exactly all the plot twists, and you know what it is that is kind of that the character is going to discover throughout the story. Um, every time there is like a new kind of plot development um, happening, as an adult reading it, you kind of know it instantly. <laughs> um, you know, it is heavily, heavily hinted that something that happens is going to be foreshadowing something that happens at the end. Um, so I think throughout the entire entirety of this book, I knew exactly where it was going, but it was still a five star read because it didn't hinder my reading of the story at all. And I think the journey that the characters take in this book was really exciting and really fun to, to kind of go along with. Um, this book is a dystopian book, I guess, in which a little girl moves to a new town and it's a town called Perfect. So as soon as she gets there, she is instantly warned alongside her family that within, as soon as people arrive in this town, they go blind. So everyone in this town is blind and they wear um, special glasses to help them see. Um, and it's their glasses are specifically designed to combat this very specific blindness. So she has come to this town because her father is an optometrist or something, um, and he is there to help fix the situation. She realises that not only have people gone blind, but they've also been brainwashed to the point where her mother doesn't even recognise her anymore because she is too unperfect and she's too flawed to fit into the society. So that she kind of then has to fix the town and she has to make sure that everyone gets their sight back and sees the town for what it truly is. Um, and it was just a really fun and enjoyable adventure. It was plotted perfectly so that you were constantly drawn in and every time a chapter ended you wanted to read the next chapter to see well, what was going to happen next to Violet and the character Boy. Um, I think, you know, there was there were some nice elements to it that kind of gave it a more mature feel. It's not a book that shies away from the darkness of reality, and it's not a book that kind of tried to make things all light and happy um, for a child. It's things that actually address real world issues and quite, you know, impactful issues on many people's lives. And I feel like the overall, like, kind of plot of Violet's story arc is a very insidious concept of being forgotten by your parents um, and I found that you know it I think that that's something that's going to feed on a lot of um, children's biggest fears um, and it plays with that kind of storyline in a very interesting way and it it was dark and it was kind of scary in that respect um, but the the character of Violet was really inspirational. She worked so great at kind of solving the problem and fixing the problem at hand and um, she was just, she was brave but she was also really cowardly and it was a really nice kind of mix to understand, you know, who she is as a flawed person who isn't perfect and what does perfect truly mean, etc, etc. Um, so I really, really liked it. It was just fast paced, I read it in like a few sittings, um, there were times where I couldn't put it down. So it's just one that I really thoroughly enjoyed. Um, so of course they were both five star reads and when I was thinking about it, because they're both five star reads in very different ways and it made me think of um, Amy from Amy Gets Lit. She did her Q&A and I think somebody asked her what makes a five star read for you and she gave a very lovely answer. Um, and I'll link her video down below so you can watch it to not only see her answer but see all her answers and to her, and her answer to the question that I asked. Um, however, 
it made me think about what makes a five star read for me and I was like looking through sort of the books that I have previously given five stars and they are all quite different there's no real common theme and I know I have made a video about sort of um, bookish buzzwords that will make me pick up a book but that doesn't necessarily mean that that book's going to be a five star read um, so with these two books, trying to figure out what makes a five-star read um, for me personally was tricky. Um, I guess it definitely has something to do with the the voice and the author's style of writing. I think I need something that's not trying too hard to be something else. I think a lot of authors, um, one that I've just particularly finished reading, has tried to emulate a specific style of a book that they think that their book is like. Um, and oftentimes it just feels really forced and it just feels quite disingenuous. Um, so I, I need a voice to kind of feel naturally their own voice, if you know what I mean. Um, and then I think plot-wise, particularly for at least these two books, um, it's not, not always I need a book that needs um, a plot. Sometimes I quite like the books that are just character development, for, but for perhaps a children's book to be a five-star read, I, I would prefer the plot to be um, just so well paced that um, there are no points that kind of feel like a plateau um, where the author kind of might be thinking that to get from point A to B um, they need to have an X amount of word count perhaps or something. I think that you know there aren't any rules as to how many words go between A and B but it can be overwritten and um, it kind of makes you just kind of feel like you're dragging yourself a little bit through that that part of the book. Um, both of these books, I feel, didn't have those moments for me. Um, it was constantly from A to B to C to D to E to F to G, and I was constantly being moved forwards, and that was something that made it feel exciting, and it made it feel fresh, and it made me wonder what was going to happen next. Um, which is always a great thing as a reader, that's what you kind of want. You want to be kind of forced through a text at high speed um, just because it's that good that you can't put it down. I also think the characters of these books made it a five-star read because they weren't, they weren't just one thing um, or they weren't just like the good side and then the bad side of them. They actually had multiple facets in very different ways. They were all these things at once that kind of construct a good character um, and it was sustained and it was developed throughout the entire book. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of these books at least, the things that they share and that make them the five star read is um, sort of uh, an original voice, um, a, f a fast driven plot and well rounded characters and I think it just shows a skill on the author's behalf. Um, and that they have carefully considered their writing as a craft and they have carefully honed it and I think that's something that I will always appreciate is the thought and the, the kind of care that goes in to the creating of a book that makes it so much easier for a reader to get completely lost inside that book. Um, and I think these two books have definitely done it and both of them our first books of series. I don't think the second book is out for this one yet, but the second book is out for this one, so hopefully I will get to that at some point soon. Um, and I've got two more books. I've got Eye of the North by Sinead O'Hart to read, and I've got um, The Murderer's Ape by Jakob Wigelius to read. Um, so hopefully I'll get to them soon and I can update you with my review for those two books. So I'll see you next time for another video. Bye bye.